Thanks very much. Uh, I appreciate you also weaving our panelists together and, and pointing out all the uh, many ways that we stand on each other's shoulders. Um, we have a lot to thank Roger, Mark, and Eric Goldberger for, for initiating Mimic amongst others. Um, and thanks for um, pointing out that we need to rethink the way we assess machine learning models. That's, that's really, really important. Um, over the years, we've had many conversations about the importance of including the reaction of the patient and the treatment um, to treatment and the clinical decision support messages from the clinicians. And this goes back to your roots in control theory, I know, and now the more fashionable domain of reinforcement learning. So this leads that with your comments about EPIC and the drop down me menus leads us on to our next speaker. Um, who will be discussing some of these issues. I'm delighted uh, that uh, Dr. Raj Ratwani uh, can join us today. He's the Associate Professor at uh, Georgetown University School of Medicine and Vice President of Scientific Affairs for the MedStar Health Research Institute, as well as the Director of Meds the MedStar National Health, Cent uh, Health National Center for Human Factors in Healthcare. As the Director, he oversees the Center's vision and strategy and has overall responsibility for the Center's activities. Um, he's also an active researcher serving as a principal investigator on numerous grants and contracts from the NIH and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, Dr. Radwani is going to address these key issues on human factors in the context uh, of the use of machine learning algorithms in healthcare. Raj, thanks very much and well, welcome and over to you. Thank you, Gary. Appreciate it. Um, so good afternoon to everybody. And uh, I'm going to jump in by first just talking a little bit about what human factors is and it may be unfamiliar to some folks. Uh, so if you're not familiar with human factors, it's, it's pretty straightforward and I think very intuitive. Uh, it's a multidisciplinary science that really focuses on understanding human capabilities and designing technology systems, uh, processes to meet these capabilities. And uh, in applied to healthcare, we really focus on efficiency, quality, and safety. Uh, human factors has been applied in several, several different domains that each of you listening has probably been exposed to, everything from consumer electronics, ground, ground transportation, uh, aviation, nuclear energy, you name it, there's, there's tremendous application of human factors. In healthcare, it, it, it's actually relatively new and there has not been as much application. And we've heard this from each of the speakers so far, and, and it looks like the slide's a little bit cut off, but it's really about understanding the context and context is critical. So what, is, what do we mean when we say context? Typically, when we apply human factors to healthcare, we talk about kind of a, a systems engineering or a systems model, which you can see on the right side of this slide. So that's thinking about all the different technology tasks, the environment that work is being done in, uh, the organizational policies that we just heard about that might actually be conflicting with the algorithms that we're developing and making sure that the patient, the clinician, whoever's intended to use these can actually use the algorithms embedded in this larger system. I always like to show a single slide to summarize kind of a, a key point about human factors, which is this one. And so if you're going to remember anything about human factors, it's that we don't redesign humans. We spend our time redesigning the system within which humans work. So that's our way of thinking about the world. And each of you has probably experienced working, working in a system or working with a device or piece of technology that's incredibly intuitive and easy to use and how good that feels compared to working in a system or with a device that's incredibly difficult to use. Um, very, very unpleasant, and oftentimes we'll avoid it at every cost. So with that as the background, I want to jump into what we call the machine learning AI reality gap. So if we think about how most um, machine learning and AI development happen, typically it's a, it's a core team focused on accessing several different rich data sets, developing out some algorithms. They'll reach out to a handful of users typically to get some insight about how that, that uh, algorithm might be applied, and who might actually use it. But if we look then at how it's actually used, so let's take a sepsis algorithm used in the emergency department, you can see this really, really complex environment in here. And that algorithm that may have cost hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars to develop and probably had an unbelievably bright team developing that algorithm is now living in this very, very, very complex environment and may be given just seconds of somebody's attention to shape their decision-making and reasoning. If you think about this user here, this user might be exposed to one of these algorithms that we've been uh, talking about embedded in the electronic health record, but what do we actually know about that user? So let's take a step back and think about that. So this particular user here is on a 12 hour shift. If this is in the emergency department, they're interrupted 10 to 15 times per hour, not per shift, per hour. 
way too much time on the EHR, including probably time when they even get home. And they're presented with hundreds, literally hundreds of alerts. Then, and, and oftentimes competing alerts. So those can be some of the sepsis alerts we talked about. They get alerted every time a lab result comes back and is an abnormal lab result. There's alerts for depression and you name it. And there's a whole team of very, very smart scientists building different algorithms for different conditions and alerting our clinicians about what's coming next. And in emergency medicine, they're probably managing between five and 20 patients. So as we think about where these algorithms live, this is reality. And this person here is bombarded with so much information. And now here's another alert that comes in front of them to let them know about sepsis. And what happens when that kind of alert comes, when it gets to the point of implementation, it might look something like this. Your patient may have sepsis. Please review and treat the patient. If you think that the sepsis is most likely diagnosis related, please investigate and treat using the power plans via orders. If you know the patient is septic from before or has an alternative EX to explain trigger, please diagnose using confirmation button. That's a lot. That's a lot of time. And most likely what the individual is going to do is simply dismiss this alert. And we just heard about many of the challenges that come with the timing of these alerts. When are they happening in that patient's trajectory? So let's break down this alert a little bit further and think about this from a human factor perspective and how this be optimized. So the first part, and this is this is an actual alert that's used in the clinical environment. So the first part is your patient may have sepsis. Well, why does the model think this? Uh, it's probably a pretty smart clinician or clinical team that's been working on this. There's no information whatsoever about why the algorithm might be thinking that the mod, that the uh, the patient has sepsis. If any of you have ever had a plumbing problem, an electrical problem, you call in an expert or you take your car to the mechanic and the mechanic says, your engine's broken, that's gonna be $200,000. Most of you would not just fork over $200,000. Most of you would probably say, wait a minute, tell me more. Why, what's wrong with the engine? Explain to me what's going on with this particular issue. And then we have issues that pop up like, how confident is the model? Can I do something to increase the confidence? Potentially there's another test that I can order. What if I order a lactate and I haven't already? Is that gonna boost model confidence? And how much should I be believing this particular model? And then the next part of this, please review and treat the patient. Well, what should I be doing that I'm not already doing? Again, a pretty smart clinical team generally treating the patient, everybody there doing their best to treat the patient, yet very little information that comes from many of the work that we have. And then we have this huge paragraph down below, and most of our clinicians say to that, um, why are you asking me to do all this again? Uh, remember, I'm getting hundreds of these alerts, and so you, you really want me to go through a series of clicks and digest this paragraph that you put in front of me. So how do we begin to tackle some of these issues? Uh, we recently proposed uh, putting the taking this user-centered design approach, which is really focusing on our frontline clinicians and our end users, whether it's clinicians or patients, putting their needs at the forefront of development of any technology or algorithm and bringing those users in through the different life cycles of development. So that's design, development, implementation, and long-term use. And bringing in our expert clinicians early on when we're even architecting a potential uh, uh, an algorithm and trying to deeply understand the clinical environment of use and how we can begin to better shape the cognitive aspects of their reasoning and decision-making process. So instead of thinking about this as we're gonna present more information to the clinician or even different information to the clinician. Let's think about what is their traditional reasoning and decision-making process from a cognitive science perspective and provide the right information at the right time. And we just heard about the five rights of CDS, which is a big part of this, but really under this model, it's about bringing users in at every stage of design, development, implementation, and long-term use. And in particular, I wanna highlight the implementation and long-term use because those are typically the stages that we don't think about. We often think that once the algorithm is designed and developed, we're done with it. And now the healthcare system will take it or the electronic health record vendor will take it and implement it. But really that's the part that matters the most. What is that representational layer to our clinicians and how are they gonna be impacted by that information? And then long-term use becomes critical because oftentimes healthcare facilities or healthcare systems think about technology and these algorithms as a one-time cost. They think about it as a one-time investment. And they don't think about how, once the EHR is upgraded, those changes with the software, this is living, breathing software, might propagate to their algorithms. And what new evidence is arising that might actually shape use of the algorithm. So it's important that we, continue, we, we consider the user at every one of these stages. 
And I just want to quickly end with a couple um, key pieces that we've certainly learned as we've applied human factors to the development of several different algorithms, not just sepsis, and much of this work driven by our scientific director, Kristen Miller. So we've heard this workflow matters, um, really providing assistance at the right time, but importantly to the right people. And that's not always the physician. It might be the nurse. It might be somebody else on the care team and making it really easy for that information to be bombarded. Again, thinking about how many other alerts is this clinician being exposed to and what are they expected to do? Always trying to focus on answering the why. So anytime we give a clinician a piece of information or a new prediction, whether it's readmissions, sepsis, C. diff, there's always the question of how did this come to be? How did the model derive this information? And how should it be changing my thinking? How should it be changing my reasoning and decision making? And as an example of that, uh, Pyro is one of the um, predictive scores that, that's used for sepsis. And here's a, a, a visualization prototype that's been developed by Dr. Miller. And you could see the way the information here is represented makes it much easier to understand what information uh, is in the, in the critical area, what information may not be relevant here, and what's potentially missing and could be optimized. So really focusing on that layer of presentation to our, to our clinicians. And then finally, ending by saying confidence is key. We want to be able to say what the confidence level of that algorithm is if we know it, uh, potentially how often it's been right in the past, and potentially how many other colleagues are using or um, leveraging this particular information, and then optimize based off of the feedback from our clinicians. So it's only scratching the surface of how we can apply human factors, but uh, I hope everybody recognizes the importance of it, and it's not just about your development and accuracy of the algorithms, but it's very much about the implementation and sustained use of those algorithms. Thank you.